repeat for anyone who's coming even later. I'm Jasper Humphreys, Director of Programs of the Margen Conflict Biodiversity and Military Sustainability Group in the Department of War Studies in King's College, London. And I will be talking for half an hour about uh, South Africa's rhino wars. And afterwards, I'll answer any questions that you send to the Q&A box, please. And uh, many apologies to anyone who tried to join my scheduled talk two weeks ago and was unable to do so. I'm afraid that the uh, technical gremlins jinxed the system and we stopped trying after 20 minutes. So uh, welcome back and thank you to those diehards who have returned and also to anyone joining for the first time. The theme of today's talk and the two talks in one month's time is how conflict connects with the illegal wildlife trade in Africa. To be clear, we will not be talking about how to save wildlife per se, which is conservation and is a specialist science. But of course, there will be plenty of overlap between conservation and the illegal wildlife trade in our talks. Before I start discussing rhino wars, I'd like to uh, say how I was first introduced to war and wildlife. In the late 1990s, I was traveling through Mozambique, which was then trying to recover from its devastating liberation wars against its Portuguese colonial masters. Though the war had stopped a few years before my visit, there were plenty of examples of the fighting from the past. Old tanks were lying beside the roads, bridges and houses were still unrepaired. On the second day, I saw a boy selling a small dick dick antelope, which made me think. This was the first animal or bird that I had seen in Mozambique, and this was Africa, a continent with incredible biodiversity. And this meant that all the wildlife had either been eaten or traded by starving people or destroyed in the fighting process. So on reflection, this also seemed like an apocalyptic warning of a, of a world empty of wildlife and even of life itself. Until relatively recently, anyone studying and writing about war had very little to do with their environmental counterparts, if at all, and it worked the other way around. Back in 1999, leading environmentalist David Dudney wrote, for environmentalists to, drive, to dress their programs in the blood-soaked garments of the war system betrays their core values and creates confusion about the real tasks at hand. However, reality clearly demonstrated that in certain situations and locations, the two not only overlap, but were closely intertwined. This realization received a major shove with the publication of a paper in February 2009 called Warfare in Biodiversity Hotspots. Its core discussion used data analysis, which showed that there was a high percentage of conflicts since the Second World War in areas of high biodiversity, which of course included wildlife. The paper caused something of a stir, in part because of the high profile of the authors, which included Dr. Russell Mittermeier, then president of the giant NGO, Conservation International, as well as the bracketing of the words war and biodiversity. When the Margen study group started in 2010, our first major piece of research was into rhino wars, because it was a very topical subject, and it seemed an interesting type of conflict involving different types of force, both hard and soft power, all wrapped up in a conservation dynamic. You might even call it Kleischwitz and conservation. Conflict and war are bad for biodiversity and especially for wildlife, mainly in two ways. Firstly, there is the direct result of getting killed in warfare and conflict. Even low level human conflict can drive dramatic wildlife uh, declines. A study published in the journal Nature analyzed data going back to 1946 to identify the effects of human conflict on large mammal populations in Africa. The results suggested that of all the factors studied, Repeated armed conflict had the biggest impact on wildlife, and even low-level conflict could cause profound declines in large herbivore populations. The second element about conflict is that it creates the conditions of insecurity that allow the illegal wildlife trade to expand, for which South Africa is a very good example. Furthermore, it should be remembered that the overlap of conflict in the illegal wildlife trade occurs throughout many parts of the world. For example, 
The decades of high level insecurity on Myanmar's northwest border, combined with independence and security issues in India's northeast, have created a huge illegal wildlife trading region, drawing in wildlife both dead and alive from as far as Afghanistan and Pakistan and by ship from Africa. Also, some years ago, there was a belief that Al Shabaab was involved in financing itself through ivory and rhino horn poaching. But more research has shown that Al Shabaab prefer to tax the commodities as they pass through areas under its control, rather than to organize the killing and transportation of rhinos. One might be tempted to think that given all the many security problems in the world, the illegal wildlife trade would rate low down the list. That would be a wrong assumption, because in fact, depending on which report one reads, the global legal wildlife trade is either the third or fourth highest category of illegal trading, along with human trafficking, drugs, and guns. The configuration of these new agents of widespread violence gave rise to a new typology of conflict termed network war, for which the control of extractable resources is a major element, of which in turn, wildlife, of course, is a large component. Network wars have broad identifying characteristics with the actors plugged into a global supply chain through webs of illicit markets, which thrive in an era of greater communication and weaker regulation. These actors rely on force to impose their will and thereby accumulate power with no interest in assisting a state's ability to function or to help the population or biodiversity. The result is the new kleptocracy, the country's elite who see the state apparatus as an opportunity to enrich themselves with some of these people additionally working for state's department. This is the, the classic failed or semi-failed state and is often deliberately subverted for kleptocratic purposes. Conflict and the illegal wildlife trade also pose a security threat from a different angle, much in our minds at present, namely pandemics. Six years ago, there was the large Ebola outbreak in uh, West Africa. The suspected agents being fruit bats displaced from forests by logging and used in bushmeat, plus the possibility of chimpanzees caught for the live trade, as well as bushmeat. This suspected zoonotic transference worked in conjunction with the destruction and insecurity caused throughout the region from civil wars, especially to healthcare systems that were overwhelmed by Ebola. So here you have the triangle of conflict, the trade in wildlife and healthcare vulnerability leading to an epidemic. Before I start my focus on South Africa, I'm using the word conflict at various stages to cover combat, low level conflict and situations of insecurity. Additionally, it is important to understand the difference between poaching and trafficking, even if both are illegal and a part of the same chain of distribution and both basically rely on escaping detection as opposed to direct confrontation unless under attack. Trafficking refers to the illegal transportation and distribution of wildlife, while poaching refers to the killing of wildlife, which is on land that is either being looked after by the state or is privately owned. In simple terms, at one end of the scale, there is bushmeat subsistence poaching for food and skins. Indeed, for many millions of people, this is their primary source of food and income. At the other end of the scale, there is the killing of wildlife purely to generate a large amount of income, mostly either through illegal trophy hunts or killing body for body parts, such as lands, teeth and claws, ivory and rhino horn. In the middle of these two points is the growing trade in exporting bushmeat at a level which might be called an industrial scale. To give you some idea of the value of rhino horn and, and the scale of the poaching problem in South Africa, between July last year and February this year, 277 kilos of rhino horn were seized by South African police worth around 11 million pounds. And a rhino horn weighs roughly between two and four kilos. The history of killing rhinos in South Africa for, broadly falls into three sections. Firstly, the situation before the large scale arrival to South Africa of the white colonial powers 
about 200 years ago. Secondly, what happened during that colonial period and its legacy. And thirdly, the period after the official ending of apartheid in 1994 and the situation today. South Africa is well known for having both the world's greatest population of rhinos as well as the greatest number of poached rhinos. To be clear, poaching of rhinos for their horn and elephants for ivory has always existed for the indigenous people, both as a source of revenue through trading and using their skins for various items. But the numbers killed were never what we witnessed today. Today, the major demand for rhino horn has been stimulated by the expansion of the middle classes in Vietnam and China who can now afford to buy rhino horn. A number of reasons for this recent increase of rhino killing have been identified. High levels of both unemployment and lack of income, lack of education and awareness about the importance of wildlife protection, corruption at all levels of, of enforcement and protection, and highly organized crime syndicates that can facilitate the rhino horn market at every stage. The resources allocated to fighting the illegal wildlife trade are desperately small in relation to the problem. This also applies to the rhino situation in South Africa, even though it gets more resources allocated to fighting the, the problem than in any other wildlife related problem in the world. In 2007, the number of rhinos being killed in South Africa started to escalate massively until a few years later, the authorities were facing a major, major crisis with not only the poachers easily winning, but the dead rhinos were also sending a wider message to the world that South Africa was an insecure and dangerous place, which was particularly bad news because South Africa relies heavily on tourism and foreign investment. In 2012, the authorities appointed Johan Just to take charge of all operations against the rhino poachers in South Africa's national parks, a post he still holds today. Johan Just is a retired South African general, having as a young man fought in tough bush wars and counterinsurgency combat in Angola and today's Namibia during the apartheid years. And when he was appointed to his anti-poaching post, General Just sent a strong message by saying, it is a fact that South Africa, a sovereign country, is under armed attack from armed foreign criminals. We're going to take the war to these armed bandits and we aim to win it. Please notice how often General Just used the word armed. In fact, his words raised questions about whether the level of rhino poaching and the tactics against the poachers actually represent, represented something more like a civil civic war, a major internal conflict similar to the drug wars in Mexico. And well, whatever the interpretation, General Hughes wanted to send a powerful message. We will escalate the tactics against the poachers to a much, much higher level, including greater use of uh, force, uh, sometimes violent, what we would call hard power. And so after 2012, we waited and we watched. The numbers of poached rhinos kept going up from 268 in 2008 to 1,300 in 2014. Meanwhile, money was starting to come in to help South Africa fight the rhino poachers. $25 million from the Howard Buffett Foundation, 14 million euros from the Dutch Postal Lottery, money at a level never seen before for a specific conservation initiative. In the last two years, the figures have gone down, 400 last year, though this is possibly due to the COVID curfews in South Africa. But the new worry is that the combination of the rhino's very slow reproductive rate and the heavy killing of the previous years means that the rhino population overall could still be declining. In many ways, the struggle against rhino poaching, what is sometimes called counter poaching, is similar to what we know as counterinsurgency, basically a strategy of winning a conflict that does not involve full-scale warfare. This similarity is underlined by the fact that counter-poaching has attracted a fair number of people with a military background. Firstly, there is an enemy uh, of sorts who are difficult to find. Secondly, the tactics do involve tracking, surprise, and collecting intelligence. Furthermore, the rangers are moving within a population that might even be sympathetic to the poachers, 
who in turn might even be giving money to the local population. And these former military uh, personnel bring their special brand of knowledge and skills that were developed from combat in Afghanistan and elsewhere to the protection and conservation of wildlife. For instance, Neil Calron, a former Israeli paratrooper who runs the Maisha Consulting wildlife security business, talks about his transition from the Israeli Defense Forces to conservation as one of natural continuity, the standards of an ethical code that I was taught in special operations teams, and the sense of fighting for just causes were, and still are, the core values that guide me, he said. And it is from this type of thinking that we get the phrase rhino wars. With Central and Sub-Sahara Africa having the largest pr proportion of the world's megafauna of elephants, rhinos, and lions, we should also remember that with a huge global availability of small arms, wildlife poachers can easily get hold of rifles and AK-47s for hunting and self-protection. Thus, both, thus, both the poachers and the rangers are in an escalating spiral of conflict, which in South Africa involves also involves guns, drones, and other high-tech countermeasures, especially in the Kruger National Park, located on South Africa's eastern border with Mozambique. South Africa's rhino wars are an interesting example of how national security issues, both the external and internal, can be connected to biodiversity. It also highlights debates around development issues, such as poverty and land rights, as well as conceptual arguments around how we understand the use of force both hard and soft power within what has now become known as the militarization of conservation, sometimes referred to as green militarization. In relation to the illegal wildlife trade and conservation, the word militarization has broadly been used by social development academics to criticize counter poaching tactics, hence the phrase green militarization or green violence. They believe that rangers carrying rifles and using drones creates an escalation of violence, arguing that the use of force here legitimizes what they feel is coercion and violence, and also diverts financial and human resources that could be used by community-based natural resource management, CBRM. Overall, say the social development theorists, force is being applied within a militaristic dynamic of weaponizing counter poaching that works together with social exclusion. Rangers are on the ground, however, counter the milit green militarization argument basically with two arguments. Firstly, the majority of their time is spent just slogging around the bush patrolling. Secondly, carrying weapons is both for self protection and signaling intent. And indeed, in some countries in Africa, Carrying a weapon symbolizes strength and power, and without which you would not have much credibility. But we'll hear more about that in the talks in a month's time. The criminal structures supporting the rhino poaching crisis in South Africa today can be dated from the era of the so-called apartheid wars of the 1970s and 80s, when elements within the former South African Defence Force, SADAF, use the fighting and the protection of hard security laws during apartheid to organize a vast smuggling network involving ivory, rhino horn, drugs, and diamonds, particularly in conjunction with UNITA, the former Angolan resistance organization led by Jonas Savimbi. Colonel Jan Breitenbach, conservationist and commander of the famous South African 32nd Buffalo Soldiers Battalion in Angola, saw the slaughter of wildlife in that country, which he described as, as the hundreds of thousands of elephants became thousands, the thousands became hundreds, and the hundreds only a very few. So an integrated Southern African smuggling trade with Johannesburg as the hub had even wider strategic implications, the most important of which was that the smuggling enabled South African military intelligence to use influence over both its friends, like UNITA and Angola, and enemies such as Free Limo in Mozambique, who were also involved in the illicit trade. Over the longer term, however, the state's involvement in smuggling had two even more powerful consequences. First, 
the long period of fighting allowed the smuggling cartels to establish themselves with little fear of disruption. And over time, the roots of the smuggling networks grew deeper and wider, spreading corruption, evasion, and non-compliance. The second consequence was that no senior military figures were ever indicted for their part in this illegal trade, despite a major investigation carried out after the end of apartheid. Soon afterwards, a rebranding and reorganization of the defense forces from the heavily compromised SADAF to the current South African National De Defense Force, SANDAF, put further closure on the past misdeeds. And through this process, rhino horn and ivory smuggling became institutionalized within the fabric of the South African state, initially through the collaboration of the defense forces and then the government. Overall, this sent a powerful political message in the, the post-apartheid era that the agents of the state could be compromised and would likely be to be ineffective in the face of powerful interests. So I'm going to end now with two points. The first point is slightly tangential, but in that it highlights what humans can learn about warfare from our nearest relatives, the great apes and the closest being chimpanzees, which share about 98.8% of our DNA. In the 1950s, Professor Raymond Dart of Witt University of Johannesburg developed his intriguing killer ape theory. Dart had been deeply influenced by witnessing the carnage of the First World War. And over the subsequent years of groundbreaking anthropological studies, Dart came to the conclusion that war and interpersonal aggression were the driving force behind evolution in that our human ancestors were more aggressive than other primate species and thus the killer instinct became rooted into our psychology. In Kasvitsian strategic terms, chimpanzees offer plenty of interest with it being generally accepted that they make murderous group attacks. Though the exact motivation for the attacks remains elusive, it is proven that chimpanzees make regular patrols both within their territories and along the borders with neighboring groups. These patrols can lead to attacks, some of which end in fatalities. For example, chimp expert John Mitani observed a group of chimpanzees killing or fatally wounding 18 individuals from other groups. Mitani further observed that the chimp patrols were carried out in a distinctly different and purposeful manner from their normal behavior, with little eating or socializing, and the patrollers being unusually silent and moving in single file line, all the while carefully watching for signals from other chimps in the group. These attacks, in the view of another well-known chimp expert, Richard Rangham, were prompted by the desire for territorial expansion. But whether this sense of territoriality was to acquire new mates or resources has been a long-standing open question. Additionally, territoriality is not a blind strategy that works irrespective of circumstances. Just like humans, chimpanzees withdraw if they are, are outnumbered. Modern social behaviorists dismiss the killer ape theory as far too deterministic and short of violence. And while this could well be true, the theory does connect with the use of violence linked to territoriality, which is very much a contemporary subject of discussion, not least around ideas of homeland or in German, Heimat. And my second point is concerned even more directly with wildlife and war, beginning by noting the strange phenomenon that wildlife relies for its protection on the species that causes the most damage to the planet, which of course is us human beings. While we might think of this problem mostly in terms of the modern environmental movement, and reflected from a, uh, from a military perspective, mainly by the environmental impact of war. This grand dislocation has in fact been a source of human anxiety throughout history. Going back to ancient times, Lucretius, a Roman poet and philosopher, wrote a lengthy poem, De Rerum Natura, translated as On the Nature of Things. And it's basically a text about how to live and die if you want to have a happy ending. In book five of the poem, Lucretius describes how humans must nurture nature if they want to find pleasure 
and ultimate, ultimately contentment. However, Lucretius warns that when mankind breaks this understanding through violence to nature, humans enter the greatest war of all, which is being at war with themselves. Thank you very much. And now let's answer any questions in the chat room. Yeah, well, hello. Hello, can hello, you hear Captain. me? Yes, I can, Captain. Yeah. Hi, um, thank you very much for this, um, um, all this information. It was really interesting. I was just thank wondering, um, I'm looking at um, wildlife trading and trafficking, yeah. and I was wondering if you could consider wildlife trafficking as an exploitation of natural resources can you draw this um yeah this comparison between just natural resources like diamonds or minerals or oil or anything like that to yes. um wildlife well, yes uh, of course i mean they're all natural resources uh, but there, there is a difference between uh uh commodities uh, 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 which is with, with diamonds and you know cobalt and you know oil, because they are traded on an international market, uh, you know, and there's a uh, there's a, a legitimate so so called I know there's a lot of illegal but but there are uh, mechanisms for for trading these things, whereas the wildlife there is no uh, 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 real proper market as we know it as a commodity. You know, you don't trade tigers like you trade uh, diamonds. There is uh, the, to slightly confuse things, I mean, there is no market, proper market uh, like that, but the I, IUCN, which is the International uh, Conservation Union, sets quotas for wildlife that can, can be legally killed for trading by the country. So for our, um, example, a hunter, in South Africa might get a permit for allowed to kill legally two rhinos. All right, so they've got a permit and then that is, ex is exported through and that is all legally done uh, because there's, there's a lot of uh, illegality. But there's no uh, commodity uh, market like, you know, as I said, diamonds or gold or something like that. Does that make sense? Hello. Sorry, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. My mic was uh, not working properly. Okay. Um, yes, um, it absolutely makes sense. But I have um, a couple of following follow up questions because, sure. um, for instance, for drugs, it's there's no community market either, is no. it? No, is there, there? Is, no, there isn't. No, I mean, it's all illegal. So the legal wildlife trade would be much more similar to uh, drugs in the sense that. Mm -hmm. it's legal it's just that i don't know if you heard me like but i mentioned there is this uh, there are this international group there the, the iucn which hands out permits to countries to allow legally to export a certain amount of animals to because they recognize that there is this trading going on and they could be live you know if uh, five thousand monkeys can be uh, traded from you know, brazil legally and taken to america for example but uh that is the but that is the only legal mechanism and it's very very small as well yeah so drugs is probably the the nearest uh, good uh, the comparison yeah okay and so um but what what would what is the point exactly of allowing if well a few thousand monkeys to be killed i don't really understand That's is that because there's yeah. so much tr illegal trafficking anyway they just trying to monitor it in that way well well, it started, the IUCN started off, I did it, it was about 30 years ago. And they, it started with, a, you know, international groups realized that the, inter, the trade, the wildlife was being moved, you know, dead or alive all over the world, massive, massive, uh, some, and there had to be some sort of control to take the side of. They realized that for a lot of people, 
we, we do forget in the developed world that for a lot of people in the world, selling uh, uh, animals either for bush meat or alive for the trade is their only source of income. So there had to be some sort of a mechanism to allow the a, a form of trade. So they put basically quotas. That that's what it amounts to. But of course, it's a complete nonsense now, and uh, you know, and um, everyone says that the system is completely bust. You know, it's uh, it's it's not good for purpose. I mean, a lot of people, some people might disagree with me, but a lot of people think it's not fit for purpose. The legal, the wildlife trade is going on quite, a, and the whole thing has become a bit of a joke, a farce, really, putting on these quotas. Um, and therefore, it's time for a complete change. All right. Lots of people have their own personal views on this, I should add, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. And in terms of, um, you said that there is no international um, market system for wildlife or for, or that the difference between yeah. the other communities would be that yes. um, they are trading on international market, but then yeah. these wildlife, even if it's illegal, there is also some kind of international yeah. market. Oh, so the market. But it, what I'm saying is that if I wanted to, to know what the price of tin or copper, I can uh, go online and find the daily daily price of tin and, tin and copper, but I can't find the daily uh, price of, um, of a, a, a traded uh, tiger. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank All you right. very much. And um, if I could ask a last question, um, oh. could you, could we draw um, a comparison or, or a connection between wildlife trafficking and human trafficking in the sense that these two um, are not commodities, but they're um, live yes. objects? Well, they're live objects, exactly. Yes, uh, obviously it depends. Some people, you know, take, uh, have a higher uh, belief in the value of, of wildlife uh, as opposed to human life or this, that and the other. But just putting that, putting only personal preferences aside, uh, yes, you're talking, you're dealing with a live animal. And then I, and I mentioned about chimpanzees, 98.8% .8 of DNA similar to human. So, uh, you know, that makes you think uh, about it. And um, of course, there are people who feel very, very strongly about the, the, uh, the belief of animals, that, that they have feelings and that they are, you know, that they're feeling them. Therefore, they're, they, what the killing of wildlife amounts to what they call ecocide. And there is, you may know about this, this big movement to make ecocide an official uh, sixth um, international criminal uh, conventional cop alongside um, genocide and to make alongside genocide. Yeah. Um, okay. And so would you say that then wildlife trafficking is potentially closer to commodity trafficking, like drugs or? illegal diamond uh, trade or exploitation of mines, yeah. or that it is closer to human trafficking then? I think the honest answer that um, you can't really put the, the two together. I mean, I think it's a bit of both really. I mean, you've got, uh, the one thing it is, is it's, it's massive. You know, I mean, that, that's the thing that, that what people don't tend to fact is where they can tend to put, categorize wildlife uh, secondary to the needs of human life, and one can see the rationale behind that. So, but when one does that, then for then one is sort of immediately sort of down, in the instinctively downgrading the problem of the illegal wildlife trade. But as I said, it's the third or the fourth highest category of illegal trading in the world. So it's massive and it's huge. Uh, uh, but there, obviously, yes, you can't go online and find out the, the price of rhino horn, but you can trade so, uh, but you can on tin or copper. But so there is that difference, but it's a personal preference, you know. Um, uh, some people feel that it's worse than, you know, the illegal cobalt trade. They might think that the illegal wildlife trade is more money should be put into combating the illegal wildlife trade than there should be put in the uh, combating the illegal cobalt trade, for, for argument's sake. I mean, both trades are, don't have much money anyway, so it's all it's a fairly uh, circular argument, you know, from that perspective. Yeah. Okay, and then um, if because of 
because this is such a huge uh, trafficking. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is it a bit similar to commodities like not, uh, mine minerals in the sense that there are so many different minerals that are traded illegally or legally? Is yeah. that the same for wildlife? Because obviously a horn is really different from ivory to skin or to clothes or that kind of thing. So could yeah. you compare these as being different types of commodities within the wildlife trafficking? It's, it's where the difference comes is where they're ending up. Rhino horn is basically, as I said in my talk, a, uh, going to the uh, Chinese and uh, Vietnamese middle classes because they've been, it's in, it's in the, their culture, in the belief that it is, it's an aphrodisiac. And it's a, so it's a lifestyle choice. It's a choice, you know, you pay a lot of money for this lifestyle choice. It doesn't, you know, make you richer or anything like that. It's just a lifestyle choice. Uh, the same you can sort of say for ivory. It's same thing. It's a sort of it's a lifestyle choice. You can you might you if you're in a business person you might give it as a gift, as a very substantial significant gift if you're trying to do a significant business deal. But it's still a lifestyle choice. Whereas if you're talking about forestry or, or diamonds, they have a just different end product you know forestry could be making exotic furniture or it could be for uh going for biomass or whatever whatever so it's the where the end is it has is the where the difference is it's how the ending is is the important point okay thank you very much okay thanks Kevin. bye hello is anyone else want to ask a question Okay, is there, let's have a look. Uh, uh, Alexander, right, uh, answer live, let's go and answer. Could, uh, this is one from Leslie, could not non-lethal force be used rather than bullets, e.g. tranquilizer darts, or is practiced to shoot to kill on every occasion that rangers come across armed poachers? Right, uh, I'm gonna, can you hear me all right? on that, that question, right? The answer, hello, right. The answer- oh, Yes, right. I can, sorry. I didn't realize you wanted to ask. Can question. you hear that? Is that you, uh, G. Leslie? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I repeat you, could not non-lethal force be used rather than bullets, e.g. Uh, tranquilizer it up? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, again, what is very important about this before we touched upon exactly on, on your question, is it's all about context. I mean, what the poaching situation in, in England is very different to uh, the poaching situation if you're in the Central African Republic, Congo, or South Africa. Because if you are uh, a ranger in those African countries, you will be coming up against people who will uh, carry guns and, will they, and they will use them against you. And uh, we, as you hear regularly from the Congo, uh, rangers get killed uh, frequently. That is particularly a, a particularly dangerous spot. But the point is, as I said in my talk, and I've talked with uh, rangers all around Africa, and where that, as I said, that you need to uh, carry weapons for self-protection, and sometimes, of course, to protect yourself from uh, the wildlife. But when you mentioned about tranquilizer darts, are you talking about tranquilizing people? Or yes. Yes, I am. You are. Uh, yeah. because, you know, it, there might be a situation where you could uh, um, dart the person if it's sufficiently quick action uh, as soon as you come across them so that they can't go ahead and what they're doing what they're doing. Or sure. maybe they could be shot in if, they, if, you, if you're likely to be shot dead, presumably they would shoot you dead. Yeah. Maybe you can shoot their, their, uh, their, their knees so, that they, so they fall down so that they can't proceed to do what they were going to do rather than actually kill them. I don't know what the codes of practice are. Yeah, well, um, um, yeah, I, I, I just need to get the, I mean, uh, I have to say, I've never heard of um, human tranquilizing. <laughs> I have to say, uh, good idea in theory. I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, I've been out with range of it. All I can say that if you've ever walked around the African bush, uh, it is A, it is very difficult. It's it's very inhospitable. Inhospitable, you know, those thorns are about 
four inches long, is dry, is hot, and you're, and you're more than likely going to be ambushed. So you don't have a chance to, 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 to pick your, your whereabouts you're going to shoot, shoot the person. So that sort of answers that bit. And the other bit uh, is about shoot to kill. They, I mean, I, I, uh, I know that the shoot to kill policy is, uh, there isn't a, a, the policy about engaging with poachers is that broadly they are, as far as I, as I know, is that they are basically uh, apprehended. The, the, the only shooting human to human that goes on is that if they're if the rangers are engaged being shot at they return the fire and also uh, trying to warn the person as much as possible that they will more than likely come off worse in the in the in the fight but of course that is in a very theoretical situation if you're in the in the middle of the congo uh, uh, bush or the, the forest and you know three or four people are shooting at you you're not going to get a chance to uh, have that sort of dialogue yeah. Sorry, Leslie, uh, I think I'm going to have to go on to, uh, but um, we've got another talk in a couple of in a month's time. I have a second. Uh, and my colleagues there, Stefan Crane and uh, Adrian Garside, are, have both been involved very much in range in Central Africa and are very well, much better equipped to answer that question. And would, I'm delighted to answer it as well. So tune in in a month's time, uh, Leslie. All right. OK. So coming back to uh, Alexander Lee. Alexander? Alexander? Hi, yeah. Yeah, I've got your question here. How Thank can you. local, national and international institutions deal with the transfer of violence from other conflicts? Uh, war criminals organizing poaching? At... Right. Well, one, one way that has been tried um, is the, to integrate uh, uh, former soldiers into the uh, ranger ranger forces. There, there are problems in that. One, as always, money to do these things. You know, it's very, very difficult. B, that you know, a lot of these groups come from different militias and this, that, and the other, and if you're trying to get them all on the same roof and to, you know, to, to behave properly, that's very difficult. Uh, so um, the so I think those are the sort of the main, main problems. Can you think of other, other one things, situations, anything in your mind? You, you said war criminal organizing poaching efforts. Um, in a way, have I answered that question? Yes, thank you. I, I think what I, was, what I was driving at is, uh, I think that from a internationally, uh, from a legal standpoint, I think it'd be relatively easy to find uh, loopholes that would allow uh, institutions at various levels to target uh, poaching uh, organizers uh, by addressing uh, other activities that they have done in the past or continue to do uh, in regards to war crimes or uh, other such illegal activities. Indeed, uh, wouldn't that be lovely? But the trouble is that the, I mean, to put it bluntly, there's such so much corruption uh, and uh, as I mentioned, klep kleptocracy in the whole systems in these countries, that it relies on enormous efforts, basically by outside U international organizations to bring these sort of these people, warlords or whatever, to account. But you've seen the, I don't know if you're following the trials of the international criminal courts, trying to bring some of these um, Congolese warlords. I mean, it takes years and years and years and years. Uh, to, to do, uh, and there just aren't, aren't the legal resources that at that disposal to this, but sad as it is, you know, wish that it was, but I'm afraid the reality is that there aren't. It, does that sort of answer your question without a proper answer? I don't know. No, I, I think that answers my question. Thank you. Sorry, right. Okay, now we've got uh, Durad. Uh, right. Hi, Durad. Uh, hello, Gerard. Hi, Justin. How are you doing? Uh, great. I've got your question here. With the prospect that internal and expeditionary military involvement in anti-poaching activities will increase going forward, what are the, the key lessons you think militaries and governments should identify and, and implement from the South African case studies? You're right. Gosh, that's quite a that's a, a good one. Um, I the the. Uh, 
I, they've got to be very, first of all, very aware that, that they're separating what they're doing, whether they are there uh, practicing counterinsurgency or whether they're there to, to, to uh, act to organize, to organize counter poaching and whether their, their counter poaching is just restricted just to teaching the local rangers or whether they actually get engaged themselves with a much more confrontational type um, uh, counter poaching uh, effort. A, and also learning that if they do get involved with the, the counter poaching, a, a more hard power exercise, that there could well be a, a political repercussion for, for that. So to be very, very careful uh, about that. Um, the other, the, the fact was the South African example from the 70s and 80s showed that there was a lack of accountability and therefore that all um, military activity with counterpoaching should be as transparent as possible. Obviously not to compromise strategic objectives and that sort of thing, but the, the, it must be seen to be accountable to some sort of uh, panel or organize, international organization that can monitor the activities so, every, so there are no um, ambiguities about um, the exact roles and the identities of the people and what's going on. Does that help you there, Duray? It does, thank you. And thank you for a very, for a very timely insight. Okay, great, thank you. Um, I think, is that, uh, have you got any more? Uh, uh, ah, right, another one from Leslie, is it? Uh, uh, hello? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I got that. What, uh, what percentage of rangers are untrustworthy? Is that what you? Or, I know that in certain parks, um, it's as if the people are are absent when the people are going to cross into the national parks and do their their, their coaching. I remember the various programs. I can't remember um, which countries yeah. it was actually in. Right. So then there seems to be need to be perhaps some some way to to ensure that those who are employed mm -hmm. are, have their backgrounds checked out so that they're not likely to be um, bri bribable. And the other, um, so I wondered um, what knowledge you have on, on the percentage of, of rangers who, 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 can be, who can be bribed. And they also, there was this Al Jazeera documentary yeah. showing that somebody very high up, I think it was in military intelligence, I thought it was in, um, yeah. in South Africa who, who was actually involved in, in Doing in, in almost in, in in the deal in the deal making with regard to the smuggling of ivory. So I wonder how right. predominant because you mentioned you know the uh, involvement of the military in yeah. some places. And what's your knowledge yeah. over this kind of area? Yeah, I I, I have no figures whatsoever about who is um, um, untrustworthy. I don't think they've you. It, it's like um, how long is a piece of string? Basically, I mean it's it, you know it, it, it's. Um, impossible to, to quantify. So, uh, and particularly in African countries, I mean, you know, uh, without naming countries particularly, but the, the, the military and the ranger forces, are, a lot of them are, are inter, uh, in, interwoven together. And they also come under the control of, uh, of ministers and general who, uh, you know, take the main share of the illegal trade. So, you know, how long is the piece of string? But all one can say is that the military in these countries have the, the uh, ability to do all the, they have the lorries, the transportation connection, they have the logistics, the, you know, and they have the power to, as well, to order things to, to be done that other people would not be able to do. So I know that doesn't really uh, answer the question that you probably want, but I think it is, is the reality. And, uh, and, and again, you have to be careful about how one applies the word untrustworthy. What would seem to be untrustworthy to us might not be seen to be untrustworthy to within the context of an African situation where you know money is very very difficult, uh, you know as, as jobs where illegality, legal is very very uh, ill-defined, where the dividing line is. But this. Uh, this case of um, actual um, head of um, 
uh, move from one area to being head of, I think, military intelligence in South Africa seems incredibly shock shocking. He, yeah, he's yeah. directly involved with the with the Chinese agents to yeah. ensure that this uh, consignment of uh, ivory got right. through. So was that military guy prosecuted? And who prosecuted? Oh no, no. He's 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 moved from one position to virtually in charge of, and he stopped. Yeah. Well, Stop this inquiry are. getting on, you know, but I thought yeah. I was as gobsmacked. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's outrageous. But one has to say, I mean, we are, you know, the, the world is rightly uh, uh, up in arms like you uh, about what's going on. But if the country, A, the country that the country itself won't take action against these people, what help, hope is, uh, you know, outside it? And B, I mean, it's very easy for, you know, why don't, why doesn't the International Criminal Court or something go after them? Because, you know, for vested interests, because we've got, you know, political ties with South Africa and we don't want to rock the boat for over just one small, what is considered a small issue when there are much bigger geopolitical problems to, to, to sort out. And I'm afraid that's the reality. I'm sorry, Leslie. Yeah. Yeah, but that wouldn't be, it's not a crime against humanity, so it couldn't be taken to the International Court, but it certainly should be actionable. Exactly. Yeah, the, the problem, yes, it's very, again, it's very, very difficult to take a wildlife crime. Uh, anyway, I've gone, you know, uh, it has to, basically, it has to be done in the country. And, uh, and the level of prosecutions for, for approaching South Africa are very, very small. There you go. Thank you. And, and even those are very politically motivated. You know, they are. They will go after someone for a particular reason. Uh, they don't just happen because a lot of them they just turned a, a blind eye. Turned. Yeah. So sorry, Leslie. <laughs> yeah. But uh, thank you for your interest. Have you got another question? It's, it's very. It's very prevalent, is it? Really, in many countries. Then you've got the. the uh... Yes, it is very prevalent. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry to say. Yeah. Uh, going on to another one, uh, Peter Chris, how has the internet, perhaps the dark web, affected trends in the illegal wildlife trade? Well, massively. Are you there, Peter? Hello? Hello, Peter, can you hear me? No, okay. uh, anyway, Peter's question was, how has the internet, perhaps the dark web, affected trends in the illegal wildlife trade? Um, yeah, as I said, massively, because people can, just like any other legal uh, drugs, guns, whatever, it's opened up a whole new uh, trading world, which didn't, a uh, methodology that didn't e exist before. Uh, and I know various um, wildlife NGOs are trying to crack down on this uh, by tracking the web and this, that and the other. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's an uphill struggle, of course. And, um, you know, if you manage to uh, apprehend one trade out, there's always many other traders doing it. So it's, it's rather depressing, uh, I'm afraid to say, but that is again, the truth. Most things about the illegal wildlife trade are depressing. They're, they're up, there are some you know, good lights, of, you know, successes, which is always good, but the majority of it is grim news, I'm afraid to say. Right, uh, Elizabeth Hart, uh, how do you think this type of corruption could be tackled? Uh, Elizabeth, are you there? Hello? Oh, no. Hello, uh, Elizabeth, type corruption to be tackled. Well, uh, all the things, I don't know if you've been listening to what I've been saying, that uh, first of all, they should um, institute uh, proper international courts for illegal wildlife trafficking, trafficking. The countries themselves should be doing the, taking the, uh, to be indicting people, left, right and center. Uh, the international community should be putting out uh, Interpol messages, you know, the, the whole works should, should, be, should be enacted. But of course it doesn't because wildlife uh, is considered uh, lower down the, the list of all the other human related problems. So the chances are, are very uh, slim of uh, getting uh, is much action to be done. I'm afraid I'm rather uh, cynical about it, but um, you know, experience tells that this is the, the harsh reality. Okay, sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, I think that's uh, that's it. Answered open questions. Uh, I think that's all I've got space for.
Right. I think that's it. Right. Okay. I think um, that's it. Thank you all very much and um, hope to see you back in a month's time. The details will be circulated uh, pretty shortly. Thank you. Goodbye.